This lecture is the last in our series from chapter 11, and the topic for this one is fisheries and aquaculture. So we're going to look at how we obtain fish from the ocean, the different methods that are used, and what sustainable fishing is, and then we'll finish with uh, a discussion of aquaculture. So first, um, whenever we fish from the ocean, we need to figure out a way to get the net around the fish. That's the most basic goal. And we're going to go through four different methods of fishing, and then we'll talk about sonar and its use. So the first fishing method that's pictured here on the right is purse seine fishing. And in purse seine fishing, a boat drags a large net, it's sort of like a drawstring net, that around the school of fish. And then what they do is once they've dragged the net all the way around, they pull the drawstrings, draw the bottom together, draw the top together, and then pull the fish up. Now, one of the problems with purse seine fishing, one of the drawbacks, is that they also catch a large number of dolphins because dolphins frequently surround the schools of fish and are feeding. So they're, they've developed some methods um, more recently. If you've ever seen dolphin safe tuna or dolphin safe products, um, those are methods that use purse seine nets that have been adapted to let the dolphins out before they, you know, catch all the fish, because nobody wants to kill a bunch of dolphins. Now a second method, and we'll picture this on the next page, is called bottom trawling. In bottom trawling, we drag a very large net with metal plates along the bottom of the ocean floor and collect whatever f swims into that net. Now this is similar to clear cutting a forest in the type of destruction that it um, produces because we're dragging up things like coral um, that have been growing there for hundreds of years, benthic organisms, benthic meaning bottom, uh, so benthic organisms, things that live in the mud, things that live on top of the mud. Uh, so all of this, whatever was going on in the bottom habitat is completely wrecked by bottom trawling. And there's a couple other drawbacks to bottom trawling you can see here in the picture. Uh, first of all, the in the little, the little sub picture here you can see where the trawler has moved through and there are marks and these are where the corals have been these are the corals that were there they've been destroyed in that section and you can look in this lower picture here um, you can clearly see the path that was created by this bottom trawling net so the the doors on the side keep the net open the weights on the bottom drag it into the sediment and then the floats on the top keep the mouth open and whatever was living there in that bottom environment has been um, has been totally caught by this net. And then one of the other drawbacks is that there's, you know, it doesn't show it in this picture, but there's usually a stream of sediment that's produced as the bottom trawling net drags across the bottom of the ocean. It kicks up the sediment here, and that plume of sediment contains whatever pollutants um, or chemicals had sunk down into the mud, and it kind of reintroduces that to the ecosystem, which can cause problems for the fish in that area. All of that stuff gets reabsorbed and it becomes um, a, a problem for animals that live where the bottom trawling has occurred. Maybe they escaped the bottom trawling, but they then are exposed to these different pollutants and chemicals that had been sequestered out of the ecosystem. Now a second method, sorry, a third method is long line fishing. Long line fishing, um, the process involves dragging 80 mile long lines that are hung with baited hooks and they drag them through the ocean. The lines are held up by these little buoys at the surface and then the hooks drag down under the water. Now one of the biggest problems with long line fishing is that they catch anything that's attracted to those lines. So this could be dolphins, seals, sharks, fish, turtles, birds. You can see in this diagram here there's a seabird that's been captured. So all of these, um, this really is a problem because the line it does not discriminate. It's not targeting any specific kind of fish. It's just kind of catching whatever. So long line fishing um, has been a big problem, especially for sh the shark population. And they're making moves to possibly ban it, but it, it hasn't really. It's been banned in certain areas, but it hasn't been banned globally yet. So the fourth method of fishing is drift net fishing. Drift net fishing is similar to long line fishing, but instead of dragging a line through the ocean, you're dragging 40 mile long gill nets. Now gill nets are very fine nets. They can't really be seen by the animals, and so lots of animals will swim into them. Same problem here. It leads to overfishing, and it creates a large amount of bycatch. Now, bycatch is defined as any kind of animal that's caught that you weren't trying to catch. 
So in the case of longlining and drift net fishing, bycatch may actually be 50 or 60 percent of your catch. And that means that you're throwing away the majority of what you've caught and killed because it's useless to you. Now, there, um, drift net fishing is so destructive that there was a moratorium passed. Um, moratorium means a ban, sort of a global ban, on this kind of fishing passed by the United Nations in 1991. Now, um, people still violate that. They still use drift net fishing all over the place. It's, um, it's illegal, but they still do it. And then this picture down below here shows a drift net, a gill net, um, in Baja, California that has caught a whole bunch of sea lions that were playing in that area. So um, the lucky ones are able to escape maybe with some net tangled around them. The rest of these here have drowned. And it's really sad. These are the kinds of things that we see happen because people don't really care whether they catch something that they don't want. Um, they're more interested in their harvest. And then a lot of times what happens actually is that these nets will rip or break away from the boat and then they'll just be left drifting. And so even when they're drifting, even if they're not being towed through the water, they're still going to catch things. And so that's one reason why um, people are trying really hard to make there be rules, like you have to bring in all of your fishing equipment. You can't leave it drifting in the ocean. Now sonar, sonar is another method of um, fishing, but it's actually a method for targeting fish. So in sonar, they use sound waves to locate where the schools of fish are and that way they can more efficiently catch them. So here's a picture of a big boat that's using a sound wave here, sonar in yellow, and they're scanning back and forth and they've discovered that there's a school of fish here, so now they're dragging their giant net around the school of fish and then they're going to catch it. Now the problem with sonar is that it makes before sonar, it used to be sort of a, a skill to fishing, like, hey, where are the fish likely to hang out? How are we going to find them? We're not really sure. Gee, maybe we catch fish today, maybe we don't. But with the introduction of sonar into fishing, um, now it's just these giant factory fishing boats that can find, they can bounce from school of fish to school of fish. They never miss because they can see right where the fish are. So it takes all of the skill out of it, and it also makes it a very lopsided battle. Um, one, one scientist said that we're waging a war against fish and we're winning. So that's not something we want to have happen though because we want to have these fish around to eat. So sonar is one of those methods where it's not, it's not destructive in and of itself necessarily, but it is making it much easier for fishermen to target the fish that they want and find the fish that they want, which makes them able to fish more, capture more fish. So quiz question for you, the fishing method which is most destructive to the benthic habitat would be A, long line fishing, B, bottom trawling, C, purse seine fishing, or D, drift net fishing. So go ahead and think about that. Um, think about what the word benthic means, that's important here. And if you haven't picked your answer yet, go ahead and pause so that you have a chance to think about it. The correct answer is B, bottom trawling. All right, so bottom trawling drags along the floor, the bottom of the ocean, and that bottom is also known as benthic. The benthic habitat is the bottom of whatever we're talking about, bottom of a lake, bottom of a river, bottom of an ocean. In this case, benthic means bottom, and bottom trawling drags along the bottom, so it makes sense. All right, so what can you do to help? So um, first of all, as far as sustainable fishing is concerned, um, they have fisheries management programs in individual countries that help prevent the tragedy of the commons in their areas, in those fish that they manage. So um, they will say, like, this is how many fish you can catch. They have catch limits. They might say that each boat has a quota, like it can catch a certain number of fish, and then they can transfer that quota, like they can sell it or trade it to another boat if they wanted to. Uh, they also have specialized gear, like we talked about, the specialized per seine fishing nets. Um, they have specialized gear that prevents bycatch in some ways. So they've developed one, like a, there's one called a turtle exclusion device that allows sea turtles to swim out of the large bottom trawling nets that they use. And that allows the sea turtles to get away and they can catch the shrimp or whatever they're going for. And then finally, um, consumers like you guys can help purchase sustainable seafood. So there's a couple of logos here from different organizations. Seafood Watch is one of the, one of the organizations that, um, 
overseas. Um, in a sense, they're kind of like a watchdog group, but they go out and they independently monitor the different fisheries. They do their own inspections, they look at data, and then they determine whether a fishery is managed well or not. The Marine Stewardship Council does something similar. They certify whether seafood um, has been caught sustainably or not. And then we've got this like little logo here. These are the Whole Foods ratings. They're taken from Seafood Watch. But um, So if it's green, it's a best choice, which means that the fishery is abundant and it's well managed and it's caught in environmentally friendly ways. If it's yellow, it's a good alternative. There may be some concerns about it. Um, because of health impacts to humans or because of habitat destruction, but it's still, it's a good alternative if you can't find green. And then the red is for a void. Um, that means that these fish are caught in ways that harm other marine life or the environment. You shouldn't eat them. And then they may have, you may see gray at Whole Foods if you go there to shop and it'll say not yet rated. But that's, um, I haven't seen that when I've shopped. Usually you can find, um, I think actually if you go to Whole Foods, I'm pretty sure they don't even carry any of the Avoid products. I think they carry mainly just the best choice and good alternatives, which is kind of nice. So aquaculture, what about aquaculture? Uh, fish farming, aquaculture is a type of fish farming. So aqua meaning water, culture to grow something. This is a way of raising fish in a controlled environment and harvesting them when they're large enough. So this picture here on the right is a picture of a bunch of little aquaculture pens along the coast. And each of those little squares has fish living in it. And they feed the fish and they, they give the fish antibiotics and whatever they need to do. It's sort of like a CAFO for fish in a sense. Um, it's a highly concentrated environment produces a lot of waste. We'll talk about the drawbacks. So benefits of aquaculture um, produces a high yield and it doesn't deplete wild stocks of fish directly. So if you're raising fish in aquaculture pens and you're not going out and fishing, then you're actually allowing some of those wild fish to continue to live. The drawbacks though are many. Um, so first of all, in a lot of aquaculture there's a high input of antibiotics and nutrients. Um, so you could call this aquaculture, you could also call it fish farming. So they put in a lot of antibiotics and nutrients to feed those fish. They also often will catch small wild caught fish like sardines or anchovies, grind them up and then feed those to the farming, farmed fish, which is not really reducing the impact on the wild caught population, it's just moving the impact from the larger species to the smaller species. Another problem is that pollutants from these tanks, from these pens, can leach into the surrounding water. The pollutants could be the waste, um, the waste products from these fish. It could also be um, the antibiotics that are put in there. And then finally, the coastal habitat. For some of these aquaculture projects, they have to actually destroy the mangroves and in order to put in their shrimp farms or their other aquaculture. So we have huge regions um, of Southeast Asia that have had their mangrove forests cut down so that they can build fish fish farms there. And then what ends up happening is particularly it's shrimp farms actually. But ones that what ends up happening is the next time they have a typhoon or a monsoon or a really heavy storm, the mangroves aren't there to protect the coastline anymore. And so entire villages are being wiped out because of that. Not to mention destroying huge swaths of mangrove um, counts as habitat destruction. So what can you do to help? So first of all, you can download the Seafood Watch Pocket Guide from seafoodwatch.org, or you can actually go on the App Store and download the Seafood Watch app for your phone, which is fantastic. Um, basically, the app carries all the information you need with you on your phone, so you don't need to worry about having that pocket guide in your wallet. So before you go and buy seafood, make sure you know where it comes from. And then use the app, like if you even have to, like if you're at Albertsons, you want to buy shrimp, and it doesn't tell you where it comes from, ask the butcher. He should know. So then um, use, you can then use the app to look up and make sure that you're only purchasing sustainable seafood. And like we've been saying all along, this is how you vote with your dollar. So this actually applies not only to wild-caught seafood, but also to farmed seafood. There are some types of aquaculture and fish farming that are done very, very well, and they're sustainable and they're good for the planet. Um, a lot of tilapia is actually farmed on land in fresh water or in salt water um, in these big tanks. Like they can do tilapia farming in Ohio. So some of it is better. Um, the waste is all contained and it's done sustainably. That would be the kind of fish farming or seafood you'd want to go for. So it's just a matter of educating yourself and taking the time to make good choices with your money. And I know that you guys don't do a lot of purchasing now, but as you grow up, as you have to make those decisions, whenever you're at the supermarket, just think about what you're buying. 
So that's all we have for chapter 11. Thank you very much for listening and I'll see you in class.